So today we've got on the podcast a guy called William Story. If anyone's a Formula One fan, they'll know him as the sponsor of a Haas team uh, with his energy drink called Rich Energy. It's quite controversial. A couple of weeks ago, he put some news out about sponsoring another team. Um, Bruno, you're not interested? He sponsors a race team um, with one of the riders, James Hillier, who was a guest um, and a good friend of mine. And also he's been trying to buy Sunderland Football Club. So when you're buying a football club like William is, obviously he's not using his own money. So what I'm going to do is delve into all the financial side today about how he's funding it, um, how the energy drink works when they're funding uh, a sponsorship for Formula One team and also what goes on. I'm super interested, super keen to find out what's going on. Um, and hopefully, if he does sponsor a team, then me and Bruno get free tickets. William Story. Hello. Welcome to Shoreditch. Thank you. With a beard like that, let's be honest, you fit in here, don't you? Well, I'm blending in as a hipster, but it's by accident. <laughs> it's not on purpose. Are you a secret hipster, though? Uh, very, very secret. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Closet hipster. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> well, what you do is pretty cool. So, um... For anyone that, um, well, has been living under a rock for the past, God knows how many years, or doesn't watch Netflix, um, you're most notably known as the sponsor of the Haas F1 team, uh, which is on the series, uh, Drive to Survive. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, would you say notorious from that? Is that a better word? Oh, like, I can't judge myself. I mean, that'd be <laughs> ridiculous, but, uh, I thought, I thought it came across okay. Yeah. It was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. Good program. Amazing, amazing. If, if anyone's not watched it, check it out for sure. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's where I first known you. And then obviously James Hillier, who's a, uh, uh Isle of Man TT winner. Yep. Um, you sponsor his team. Um, and then that's how we got in touch, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. 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 James is a great guy. I mean, he's won the TT. He's a legend and, uh, really, really nice bloke. Yeah. Very modest. And, uh, he mentioned you. So yeah, if, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I just spoke to him this morning on, um, on a, on a really tech. nice man. Yeah. Like, yeah. Definitely both. Um, so obviously you're an entrepreneur, um, kind of an enigma because a lot of people, I think, don't understand how business works. Um, one of the ideas of the, the, the channel and the podcast is that, um, kind of explain to people how, how things work, you know, okay. especially like my companies, because people go, have you got like six companies? How do you find the time? And then I'll break it down and kind of show them. Um, one of the things of sponsoring a Formula One team, people, I don't think people understand like how that works. Um, so I was hoping you could tell us, uh, cause obviously I think it was like on paper, it's like what 60 million quid or some crazy amount of money. Um, how does it work? creating an energy drink and then sponsoring a Formula One team. Well, actually, first, how many companies do you own at the moment? Um, I've got, got to be careful on this one. I, I think I've got majority stakes in about seven companies. Okay. And, and, and what are they? Because you've got technology companies. So technology company, yeah. I've got a beef jerky company. Really? I've got, yeah. Beef wolf, jerky? Wolf jerky. Okay. Which is uh, a, a beautiful product uh, made in the Cotswolds. Uh, by two um, farming brothers who yeah. are really passionate about meat and farming and organic yeah. beef. Yeah. And um, they made some fabulous uh, beef jerky, really high quality, yeah. um, almost sort of bespoke um, stuff that was really lovely, but it wasn't necessarily wide wide scale or commercial. Yeah. And we were talking for about six months and, um, and I said, well, look, you know, I, I can create a really good brand here and I can get it out there. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know, if you can get to a certain point for me on manufacturing price, yeah. let's partner up and I'll, um, I'll, I'll create wolf jerky, which I've done. And, and actually now, I mean, the irony is the jerky business, I think is there or thereabouts nine billion a year. So it's still relatively small. Yeah. That's pretty much a tenth of the energy drink business. Yeah. But the potential is enormous. It's growing. It's yeah. a healthy, low fat, high protein snack. Yeah. Um, and the other brands in that business, like Wild West and, yeah. um, Kings, you know, frankly, I thought we're completely hopeless. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're quite confident we're going to have a, a market leading jerky brand in the next year. So with that one, did you invest money? Like I do with all my companies, I invest. I'm kind of silent, but I help with the marketing. Um, um yeah, but I mean, I, I think that the, the biggest thing you can provide is intellectual capital and time. Um, and passion, you know, yeah. and, and ultimately, you know, I mean, I've set up from nothing. 
Um, you know, I've always said overheads are the enemy of business. Any idiot yep. can spend money, and a mm-hmm. lot of them do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the fundamental thing is everything's got to be on point. You've got to have the product, you've got to have the brand, you've got to have the people, the strategy, um, and the scalability, because yeah. there's no point in doing it if you can't scale up. You can have the best products in the world. If you can only make 10,000 a week, yeah. then you've got a ceiling. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've got to, I think it, the, it, really requires a lot of preparation and thought. If you get that right, it's quite easy. There's a huge number of what I would call um, very average ideas yeah. that are well executed. I think for success, you need a really good idea that's well executed. Most people have one or the other. Yeah. You need both. So you've got um, the beef jerky business. Yeah. Um, I Next have, one. I, I'm, well, I've, I was for three years a professional gambler. So I, Basically, I did maths at university yeah, and yeah. I was obsessed with horse racing because it was just fascinating to me because there yeah. were so many factors. And I started working out an algorithm on looking at races. And I just realized that I just looked at horse races in a completely different way to other punters. And I yeah. used to spend hours of misspent youth, basically. And, yeah. I, and I used to spend hours and hours in bookies. And I used to see these guys throwing their money away. And I used to look at how that, what the rationale was. And the typical one, they'd read the racing post and they'd say, you know, who's the jockey? You know, yeah. who are the connections, the yeah. owners? Yeah. You know, what's the going? What's the form? Um, you know, what's the, you know, looking at the handicap, looking at all these different factors. Um, and I just thought, well, they're just looking at this completely the wrong way. And then I worked out the over round, which is the profit margin of the bookmakers. And I just looked at racing in a completely different way. Unfortunately, yeah. unpalatable for people to hear, horse racing is, I mean, a bit careful how I say this, but you don't have to be. it's endemically corrupt. Yeah. And if horse racing was city trading, everyone would be banged up for insider trading. And the bottom line is, if you know it's bent, and by the way, I love horse racing, and there's lots of people <laughs> in horse racing who are very honest. I'd like to make that clear. Yeah. But once you know that this is a little bit like being in a casino, it's fixed. Yeah. Then you've got the beginning of a method. And yeah. uh, I mean, yesterday I had a spare couple of hours and I won three big price winners. Um, so I, I, I just really love uh, gambling. And because ultimately it's, it's the way of backing an opinion. So, you know, so what, what kind of money can you make gambling? Like if you've got a good, like what kind of roughly kind of? Well, yesterday I made a 900% return. So there was a guy that I met about 15 years ago who yeah. was a guy called Barney Curley. He's a very famous Irish gambler. He's a legend in, yeah. in bookmaking circles. Yeah. And he, in 1978, won there or thereabouts in, in today's money about a million pounds on one race uh, by backing a horse at, I think it was Yellow, Yellow Sam, um, 25 to 1. Yeah. And he, he had agents all around Ireland yeah. backing this horse. And it yeah. should have been three to one or two to one. So I think that's the thing. It's, it's understanding the price. You know, if, if Manchester, in football parlance, for example, if Manchester United were playing Scunthorpe, mm. Man United could be, let's say, five to one on, one to five. If you were offered six to one on Manchester United, you'd pile onto it. Yeah. But one of the fascinating things is people, People seek, and this probably is a, a wider business thing, people seek solace in a price. And so when, for example, a hedge fund were to come to institutional investors and say, right, we will offer 11% per annum, yeah. well, re- respective to a high street bank, you know, which will offer you bugger all, um, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. If a hedge fund were to come and say, right, we'll offer you 30%, most people within the fund management industry would say, okay, well, that's higher risk. Therefore, we're not willing to, to mm-hmm. risk our capital. Yeah. But risk is perception. You know, if you, you know, yesterday I made 900%, you know, one day horse racing, yeah. you know, but if you back your own business, you know, I mean, in, in 2015, rich energy was worth zero, you know, from scratch. Um, in 2019, I had it valued at 100 million, you know, so you're much better off backing your own business yeah. rather than, you know, getting five, ten percent. You know, a proper businessman isn't interested in five or ten percent. Mm. That that's people who just want to hold on to their money. Yeah. And and I think you know it's a, it's a philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. Well, um, I always like the saying, "Risk is only risk if you don't know what you're doing." Mm. You know, and it's true. Well, people fear what they don't understand, and yeah. that is a that is a thing that probably goes throughout life. Yeah. Um, you know, from 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 you know high speed driving, whatever it might be, if they yeah. don't understand it, then there tends to be a fear. So getting back to your original question. Yeah. So gambling. So horse racing is a sort of a passionate hobby. I have an interest in a clothing business, yeah. uh, which is um, an Italian clothing menswear label, very yeah. high quality stuff. Our sort of 
it's called Danny Ellie. The, the, the proposition is, you know, we're, we're better than Bond Street quality for about half the price. So we on, on average do a pair of boots for 500 pounds that Tom Ford will sell for 1300. Yeah. Um, it's all, um, Italy, Italian sourced, mainly around Florence. Um, yeah, high quality sort of, you know, crocodile skin, snake skin, leather yeah. goods, um, that sort of thing. Um, so you're an investor in that one as well? Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, I do a bit of property stuff and I have a, I buy and sell cars, which is just literally a passion hobby, yeah. uh, which is why we, we were discussing about it beforehand. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do all sorts of different things, you know, whatever I, yeah. whatever I like, but I'm very fortunate to be able to do these things, but yeah. obviously I've, um, you know, worked very hard. Yeah. So, so with the energy drinks thing then, um, how did you end up in energy drinks? How really, you... really random. Yeah. Um, so a friend of mine, um, and I was managing boxers. So that's something I also do. Um, right. so I love boxing. I mean, boxing and horse racing, um, and motorsport, uh, you know, yeah, but, but boxing, I really loved. And I was very lucky to meet in about 2013, uh, Gennady Golovkin, who was the best fighter I'd ever seen, Triple yeah. G. Um, and you know, that was before anyone really knew who he was. I saw him absolutely annihilate. Um, he's a Japanese fighter in Monaco that I watched the fight yeah. and met him and, um, you know, basically became friendly with them and started to help them on the business side, commercial deals, promotion, yeah. um, and ended up becoming a sort of commercial partner. Yeah. Um, and that, that was really interesting. So obviously boxing, you know, became a, a big, a big passion point. And that's something that I, I really enjoy. And so that, so from that, you ended up in energy drinks. Yeah. So, so from, from, from the boxing, I mean, basically what happened was I was doing that as a, as a, if you like, you know, a passion project. Yeah, yeah. I then met various people. And, and what happened was there was a guy that I'd met via that yeah. who had created or his friend had created what he said was a drink that was, uh, be- better than, better than Red Bull. Um, which I was a little bit skeptical about, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I thought, well, I don't know much about the beverage world, but I'm very, very interested in brands and I'm very interested in, in business. Yeah. Um, and met this guy. He, he was a real genius. He, you know, in terms of, he was like a scientist. He created something really fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, well, then we looked at, you know, I thought, well, I know that I can create a really good brand here. Yeah. But is it scalable? Yeah. And we started going through the motions. Initially, I was going to be a distributor. In the end, I did a deal where effectively I, I, took complete control of brand commercial marketing um and what was exciting to me was you know one of the interesting things i've always thought is that brands have intangible value say nike for example if you look at their operating business it might be i'm guessing here about eight billion dollars but you'd probably add 20 billion dollars for the swoosh just do it so that's the intangible value of brands if you've got a 10 pound pair of jogging bottoms yeah you put the swoosh on them, they're $80. That yeah. is that sort of intangible thing. Virgin would yeah. be a great example as well. Um, so we looked at it and I thought, well, this is really exciting because literally rich energy, we had a liquid that was better than the market leaders. And we could, if I did my job properly, sell billions of units. Yeah. So that was exciting to me. You know, so I thought, okay, yeah. what's yeah. stopping us here? And suddenly the opportunity to take on the big boys. I mean, Monster is now a 35 billion pound company. Red Bull is yeah. a, 50 billion uh, dollar business. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I, I've got a shot here. And my, I backed myself. I felt that yeah. I could, you know, I said to everyone, once we got it all on point, it was a year or so's work to get everything spot on with the packaging, with the brand, with the proposition. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it was a huge amount of work. Um, but I felt, you know what? And I said to everyone, we can take on a beat, beat Rebel and Monster. Everyone said, you're absolutely bonkers. There's no way you can do that. You know, these guys have got billion, multi-billion dollar businesses or marketing budgets. Yeah. Um, and, and we ran with it. And I think within a year, we had 12 world champion ambassadors that I personally got. Commercial had, partners. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a, a partnership with a, in 2017, with West Ham United, a obviously Premier League football club who I happened to support. Yeah. Um, we had Alex Thompson Racing, Hugo Boss Sailing. Yeah. We had TT Riders. And we it just went from there. And yeah, then... Yeah. Formula One, you know, to, to answer the question again, is that that for me is the pinnacle of motorsport. It's probably the most successful uh, brand platform in the world. You have yeah. people like Vodafone, Marlboro, Rolex. Yeah, yeah, many of the biggest brands in the world use that as their halo platform. Yeah. Um, so clearly, for having an energy drink, our number one competitor is Red Bull. Yeah. They've spent four and a half billion in Formula One yeah. for a reason, yeah. because it's obviously working for them. Yeah. Um, we're all about extreme sports as well, and we did yeah. a few world champions. 
So it seemed to me to be a natural target to uh, to get into Formula One, and that was you know what happened. So um, where did all the funding come? Because obviously it's sixty million quid. Yep. So how did was that funded by like a, an investor or was that? So as I've started you? to build interest both in distribution and in the brand yep. and the proposition, and I felt yep. I came up with the tagline "Premium British Performance." Yeah. Um, and people were, you know, ever increasing. You know, big people were getting very interested in what we're doing. You know, yep. I had a very clear vision. Yeah. I felt, you know, and still feel we have the best product on the market. Yep. You know, we have the best packaging, the best liquid the best brand in this in this business I need to so, try it. so you're talking about you, I'm going to try it I'm going to try it it will blow your socks off uh -oh. absolutely fantastic am I going to be wired for the rest of this you, you'll certainly have enhanced energy it's, it definitely smells sugary oh, it's actually that's quite nice there's quite. no like there's no like after effect there's no aftertaste which is a I'm big not, difference from our competitors I'm not saying anything about monster but um uh, yeah, it's not, it doesn't have that stickiness. Is that, a, is that a thing? You know, it's, it feels like it sticks to your teeth. Like it doesn't want stuff. It, it's a very high quality product. I mean, it's made with mountain spring water and nice. very premium ingredients. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll, I'll give you a free supply. Yeah. Um, but, um, okay. it'll rev you up, um, on the track. But no. Uh, more and more people were, you know, were interested. I set out a very clear vision. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to what I said, you've got to have a clear strategy. Yeah. What are you trying to do? Yeah. You know, where, what's the destination? Yeah. And um, we had all the ingredients, you so, know, pardon the pun. And, and so I started to get a lot of big people behind it and, I, and the board okay. is the vision. So, you know, clearly we, you know, I raised investment from yeah. various different parties. Um, you know, and, and we will, we calculated we were getting six million dollars a race in Formula One in media value. Yeah. Um, so actually I negotiated, you know, we, I mean, I spoke to, when we go back to 2018, I tried to buy Force India. Right. And the, with the money invested. Um, that was part well, of Well, no, no, I, I raised the money separately to, to buy that because okay. that was a sort of asset backed deal. Okay. Um, just, just so, um, cause a lot of younger people watch yeah. this and cause we talk about raising like, um, Crikey, I'm a bit old then. 42. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, basically, the way, the way that works, I mean, there's lots of different ways for it to do it. I'm currently talking to a company, um, a Bitcoin mining company. Yep. A, f a friend of mine on over 10 years, big hedge fund guy. Um, the plans to raise $30 million for it. Um, and there's ways of doing it. You can do it through contacts that you know. You can, there's companies that you outsource, you pay 2% and like a 10K a month, monthly retainer. Um, so there's lots of different ways to raise money. When you talk about it, it sounds like super easy. You just like grab 100 mil from here, 100 mil from there, which you can once you get to a certain level. But obviously if you're 21 and you're looking to get 100 grand to, to like invest in your company, to them that's super alien, you know? Um, yeah. but obviously when, so when you're talking about getting investors, you have like a, you have like a, a business plan with a, a, a media deck, yeah. a media value. Um, and then you can raise capital based on that, yeah. but you sell a percentage of your company. Yeah. So like that $30 million that, um, we're talking about for this company is 32% of the company. Yeah. Um, and then obviously 2% commissions go out, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you'll do a second round later on. And yeah. depending on how the first year goes and if you want to either float the company or whatever. Yeah. Um, so with the energy drink, obviously I don't have to go into it completely, but. Did you have like an initial round that you wanted to raise like 50 million or 10 million? Well, it or? won't surprise you to know that I do things a little bit differently. So I, no. I'm, I'm not really interested in following what other people do. So I mean, yeah. but I am very interested in business. So yeah. if you look, for example, at hedge funds, um, I mean, one thing I would say, if you, you know, if, if young aspiring business people are watching, you know, and I'm delighted to share everything about, you know, what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but people buy track record. And so there's no quick route to success. You know, there's yeah. years and years of hard work for overnight success. You know, that, yeah. that classic thing. Um, and, and the reality is that, you know, I worked all of my twenties, you know, for, for very little money, yeah. but I was gaining experience. I was working with lots of different people with very little reward, but I was learning and I was having fun. You know, I think that's very important. You've got to enjoy life every single day. Yeah. So, but in terms of raising money, if you look at say, and I've looked into this in great depth, if you look at say hedge funds, what they generally do, let's say OD asset management. Well, Crispin Odie was a trader. I know Crispin. Yeah. And he was, um, you know, successful. So for a start, he's, he 
he's learned his trade. He understands how the business works. He's obviously yeah. betting on commodities and equities, etc. Obviously, it's quite topical. You know, he often shorting equities, so taking a position against a company. But you know, he now has got forty billion under management, and that's gone yeah. up from a hundred million to five hundred million to a billion. Yeah. yeah. How's he doing that? Well, you know, most of his investors will be institutional pension funds. They'll be big hitters. They'll be banks or they'll be private individuals yeah. with minimum 50 million investment. Yeah. His business is really marketing. Um, because what he's doing is selling, investing in his fund. Yeah. And so, you know, without blowing, blowing the hole in his business model, but you know, he pays very, in many cases, not always, but there's, you know, many attractive young women. You know, Cambridge graduates who are very, very beautiful. This is quite cynical, but you know, this is how it works. Five hundred thousand pounds a year, not just him, but you know, other funds. Um, yeah. and, and they will wine and dine the various decision makers from investment funds. And he's very good at getting the money into his fund. He yeah. will then deliver 12, 15, 18 yeah. percent. And, and it grows from there. It becomes yeah. a self-fulfilling prophecy. Philip Green, when he tried to buy Marks and Spencers, yeah. remember 400p a share. I think yeah. now they're, they're one pound 50. Yeah. a share. Yeah. So that was a market capitalization of 8 billion. Yeah. And this is quite relevant, but the business really was worth 11 or 12. So there was a billion pound of property portfolio to be realized. There was probably yeah. 20,000 redundancies. Here. You know, not nice, but that's what he'd do. Um, so in effect, he was saying to investment banks who were queuing up to back yeah. him, Morgan Stanley, Goldman yeah. Sachs, everybody, yeah. there's 3 billion pound of profit here. Yeah. Now he had bought, um, B BHS or C CNA before yeah. BHS, yeah. he turned a big profit. Yeah. So they were buying a track record. So I, yeah. I would say what you need to do is get under your belt yeah. is track record. Yeah. So if you've, if you've started with nothing and built something that's successful and yeah. I'd built several different companies and I'd done, I'd taken things from there to there, there were people that I'd met along the way who thought, okay, this guy can, can do it on a bigger scale. So go, go back to Chris Minodi because I've met Chris Minodi actually. Yeah. Um, he he was I think he was written as the him and his missus the posh and becks of investment I mean, he made 33 million quid in one year yeah like declared yeah which is quite good well hedge funds um, used to work on these outrageous terms which were called two and twenty so effectively they get 20 percent of all the profits they make yeah 20 yeah. well if you've got a 10 billion pound fund that's making 10 percent yeah so you've got a billion a year profit you're paying yourself 200 million, million quid and you've got two percent of fees under management yeah now that actually has become much more competitive generally now. Yeah. So I think it's almost one and 10 or there's different splits. Yeah. But again, people don't understand this business. The reality yeah. is that hedge funds, which for in the late 90s, you'll recall in early 2000s, all sorts of people were talking about this opaque, mystical industry of hedge yeah. funds. Yeah. All it is is gambling. But yeah. What you're effectively doing is gambling with other people's money on equities, on commodities, yeah. and you're taking a position. You're, yeah. you're betting, will that go up and down? In extreme cases, yeah. and we've seen recent examples, in America with various equities, you're actually moving the market by taking such a strong position. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, those guys are good at what they do. Yeah. Um, but people, again, buy track record. Funds that have been around for 15, 20 yeah. years that deliver, you know, like Odie has. Yeah. And, and that's why he's got 40 billion under management. So is this, um, is this how you did it then? Because that's what we were, I think we were talking about. Is this how you did it? Is it you, 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 you don't have a hedge fund though, right? No. No. You just, no, no, no. you, had the company, the product, yeah, I mean, the idea. Know, I, I persuaded a lot of yeah. people that I knew what I was doing, yeah. which was correct. Yeah. And they thought, right, we're, we're going to back this guy. And, okay. and, and ultimately, you know, we, it, it worked very well. But that, yeah. that's what I would say. But I mean, I'm the sort of person, I'm a little bit marmite, you know, typical fund people or investment or bankers. I mean, I've had endless problems with banks. They're the banes of my life. They, they hate me. Um, but bankers are not the sort of people who are typically going to back somebody like me because I don't tick all the boxes. So I generally go to entrepreneurs or individuals who are, who I can persuade of what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and smart people who are in business, um, want to make money so that, you know, if yeah. they, if they see a good thing, they'll back it. Yeah. And there's a lot of money out there. So there is so, a, the, like, well, one of the ironies is there is an unbelievable amount of money out yeah. there ready to be tapped. Yeah. And the skill is to tap it. Yeah. One of the phenomenons that I've seen in, you know, over the last 20 years is I've seen a lot of people who are bang average business people. Yeah. And in fact, in many cases, hopeless, you know, useless yeah. at running a business. Yeah. But they're very, very good at marketing. So yeah. you've seen this phenomenon of people raising money and then blowing it. Yeah. Conversely, there's some superb business people out there 
who can't raise money. Yeah. You know, so they're sat there with a ceiling because they can't actually scale it up. So yeah. again, you need, you need to try the yin and the yang. You need to try and get both. Getting both right is good. Yeah. I've seen it too. I know people yeah. that are similar and it's like, um, they're so good at what they do. They could be either super technical. They yeah. could be like, you know, and, but when it comes to like the market inside, it's like, they have, but it's a, it's that know. old Chinese proverb, isn't it? Smart people to know is to know what you don't know. Smart yeah. people know what they're not good at, and you get the people in yeah. to do that. I mean, yeah. I, for example, I'm absolutely hopeless at administration. Yeah. I hate paperwork. I, you know, if you said look at a spreadsheet, I, I'd just I'd yeah. be in a coma. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I run everything. Just you know, I will get the right people in, yeah. and um, you know, you need a good accountant, you need a good lawyer, yeah. and 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 it's you know, you don't need too many people as well. You know, I mean, yeah. I knew a guy who ran a billion pound a year business with eight staff. Yeah. You know, you don't need, you know, a small group of really good people is better than an army of, yeah. of mediocre people. Yeah. Brains, people's brains work in different ways. Absolutely. And um, so with rich energy then, what, what's the plan? Because, um, I saw on Twitter that you made an announcement. Wait, I saw that you were going to make an announcement and then you made an announcement. You did a video. You're drinking yeah. the uh, rich energy. Yeah. Is that in your house? Yeah. <laughs> That's a big room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what is the plan with rich energy? Um, because you can buy it online, you can yeah. buy it loads of places, but yeah. it's, we don't see it yet in shops, yeah. right? So what happened basically was everything was worth working perfectly. Um, early 19, we, or in fact late 18, we, I, I had discussions with McLaren and Williams. I then did a deal with Haas. Yeah. Uh, we actually got the team, negotiated a fantastic deal. We renamed the team Rich Energy Haas F1 with the FIA. Yeah. We had a black and gold car, our livery, our logos all over the car. Um, so suddenly a billion F1 fans knew Rich Energy. So that was point number one. Yeah. I then agreed deals with all these, super, personally agreed all the deals with supermarkets around the world. We had the biggest supermarket chain in Germany, Czech Republic. We had two supermarket chains in the UK, casino groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we then uh, were absolutely flying May, June 19. And then at the beginning of July 19, I suddenly... You know, perhaps I hadn't seen this coming, maybe a little bit complacent or just, you know, working all the time, hadn't seen it coming. I got hit with a load of lawsuits, um, from my main competitors, you right. might have heard of. Red Bull. Um, and really? yeah. And then I had some investors basically try and steal the business, uh, which I definitely didn't see coming, which was astonishing. So I was suddenly presented with this sort of fate accompli. And what I hadn't seen coming was that Haas got put under a lot of pressure and had effectively gone against me, which, again, I just couldn't believe, given that I'd given them the business, You've I'd come the to them, I was rich energy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just bizarre. So we said, suddenly went from, you know, absolutely flying to a major problem. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, I wasn't going to back down in my own business or relinquish the brand that I'd created. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I fought back. and We then had, you know, literally a year of, of lawsuits and, and legal cases and, and, you know, literally spending all my money on legal fees. Um, and, and so we were, you know, probably put derailed, you know, but, um, it was, it was actually a brilliant learning curve. You know, I saw yeah, it as a great opportunity. I was very pleased that I didn't, you know, I had my ex lawyers who tried to throw me under the bus, advise me that I had to do a deal, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it was nonsense. You got to listen to your instinct, yeah. fought back. Difficult, challenging 18 months, but actually the best thing that ever happened because three months later I set up a technology company that is now flying yeah. with data systems, which yeah. I would never have set up otherwise because I needed yeah. to make money and yeah. all my accounts frozen. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was really interesting, but it was, it was a great learning curve, you know, yeah. and, and I think the first time in life is an experience. Second time is a mistake. Third time you're an imbecile. Yeah. Um, but reference F1, what's happening is that clearly I saw the value it was delivering. Yeah. And, you know, I basically made a lot of contacts in Formula One, including the likes of Bernie Eccleston, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And, um, a friend of mine, um, has agreed a deal to buy a team. And this is current, current team. Yeah. So a current team on the grid. We yeah. looked, we looked at doing a deal for 2022 with the rich energy F1 team. Yeah. Cause we're sort of right back on a very steep upward trajectory. Yeah. Um, but it seemed easy that we could do a, a title sponsorship deal with my friend. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're doing. So we'll be a title sponsor in 2022. Okay. Um, so that will be a black and gold livery, yeah, yeah. you know, the uh, rich energy in the team name, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll be announced in due course with a partner of that team for 21. But the main thing is, you know, I want rich energy to have effectively de facto its own team. Um, yeah. And although Formula One now is stuck behind a paywall, it's on Sky, et cetera, et cetera. And I, 
I'd advocate being on BBC or ITV because obviously, you know, ordinary people who can't afford the crazy prices of Sky yeah. um, can then watch it, you know, and you'll get much bigger audiences. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to me that, um, you know, Formula One's the place to be. Yeah. And the best thing was, you know, Red Bull were desperate for me not to get into Formula One. Right. We did it, despite them. They were desperate to get me out of Formula One in the first place, which they were partially successful in because yeah. we, we ended up leaving. Um, but they haven't been successful in preventing me getting back in a second time. So, you know, I, I take that as a huge compliment. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm an I'm on speed dial terms with Red Bull's lawyers. I'm, I'm speaking to them on a weekly basis. In fact, they're actually quite intelligent people. Um, okay, cool. I shouldn't so, be surprised by that. But yeah. yeah, no, I'm not surprised. I mean, they're all wired on energy drinks half the time, so you probably never Well, I did, I did send them some rich energy and I got no response, which is uh, interesting. I would have liked to have seen the package yeah. turn up. Um, okay, so, so with rich energy then, are you back as a co-owner or is this still... Can you talk about that yet? Or is it still under negotiation? Well, or always, are you like a partner? No, no, no. I've, I've always, um, you know, I'm the founder and I've always yeah. controlled the brand, right. you know, at, yeah. from, from day one. Yeah. Um, and that hasn't changed. I mean, I think, you know, again, it's back to, you know, people don't understand. I've got to be a little bit careful with various legal things. Sure. Going, but, but the reality is that Rich Energy is an international brand created yeah. and controlled by me. Yeah. Um, there are loads of companies around the world um, but fundamentally, yes, I, I control Rich Energy and, um, you know, I'm leading it. Okay, cool. So can we know how much you own percentage wise of the business? Like 80% or I don't know, something like that? Uh, I can't say, <laughs> no, but it, it's safe to say a hefty, uh, a very hefty chunk. How about that? Great. Um, perfect. Uh, so the plan. You're a journalist, this guy. So, so the plan, I'm, not a, I'm not, not a journalist at all. I'm just, good ki- questions. I'm, I'm just interested. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the plan now is kind of what the plan was almost two years ago. Exactly right. With all the, without all yeah. the noise. I got derailed by a load of back. what I would term commercial imbeciles who yeah. thought that it would be a good idea to try and get rid of, I understand why my competitors wanted to get rid of me. Yeah. That's a compliment. But, yeah. you know, commercial suits who don't have a clue yeah. wanted a less controversial, a more generic, more vanilla brand. Of course, yeah. they're not understanding that the very reason that we were actually doing what we we're doing was because we were different and yeah. we were contrasting ourselves against the main competition. But this is why yeah. I would say, you know, what I term pejoratively spreadsheet johnnies don't yeah. often have a clue about business. If no. you put an accountant or a bean counter in charge of a business, almost without exception, for the first two years, it will report better figures. In three or four years' time, the business has died because all the creative people have left yeah. and they didn't really understand what the differentiating element was in the business. So, yeah. so it's, all, it's all fun. You know, I mean, you know, what I needed and didn't have first time around and do have now was a great backroom team of decent accountants, yeah. decent yeah. lawyers and, and good operational people. Yeah. I suppose the first time you did it all, it happened really fast. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's like, you kind of like yeah, trying yeah, to, yeah. like fires are coming up, you're trying to put them out. And then before you know, it, like, you know, it, yeah, we, I mean, this you know, around, when you're running at a million miles an hour, you can't plan for any eventuality. You've just yeah. got to just push forward. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that there's a great phrase that I like, you know, life is never perfect. Business yeah. is never perfect. You've got to dance in a rain. You can only play the hand you've got. Yeah. We had a very strong hand, yeah. played it pretty well, but you know, second time around, we'll play it better. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That's great. That's what I was hoping to find out. Good. So it's all, all planned. Everything's going to be rich great energy. Rich year. energy, I said, will become a market leader in the energy drink yeah. market. Yeah. And the brilliant thing for me is that consumers are now getting to try it. We're available yeah. on Amazon Prime. Our yeah. distribution's increasing and people are thinking, oh, do you know what? I quite like that rich energy. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the thing with a, um, a business like energy drinks distribution is probably the number one thing the thing with monster that people don't realize is that coca-cola distributed them so within a couple of years well i think they're the majority shareholders from, yeah they, they bought a 70 percent stake i think yeah so but people think oh someone's just created monster and off it went but no it was coca-cola distributing them so literally they went from nowhere to in every single fridge around the world yeah so and and that felt well, like consu- overnight for consumers to buy anything they need to see it you know yeah. i mean you'll know this impulse purchases if you yeah. see something you're prompted to potentially want to buy it. If you yeah. can't get hold of it, you can't buy it. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the brilliant thing about the energy drink business is that there's really only three strands to the business because yeah. you've got a tin of drink there Product. that is, let's say, two quid. Yeah. You can sell billions of units. That's great. Yeah. Does it look good? Yes. Does yeah. it taste good or better than the competition? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then you need to distribute it. 
then yeah. you need people to be aware of it. Yeah. So, you know, if I was ranking or rating our business, I would say that certain functions were nine or 10 out of 10. Yeah. Product design, um, you know, promotion. So it's four P's, um, four P's of yeah, marketing. Yeah. But, Product but, place, yeah. promotion and people, is it? Could well be. I don't I know. I, I, I'm not yeah. into acronyms. Yeah, yeah. Um, but distribution was our Achilles heel, but we were yeah. getting there. Yeah. But of course, one of the other interesting things is that if there's a whiff of controversy around a brand, a lot of the big corporates are a little bit nervous. So sure. we, we've, you know, it's been a really good learning curve. And, yeah. and in fact, one of the ironies is that one door shuts and multiple other ones open. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's a journey. But I, my view is if you work really hard and you're passionate, you'll get a result. Yeah. But if you get a few bloody noses along the way, then, you know, it's all part and, part and parcel. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that people, um, don't realize because they go, Oh, rich energy is everywhere, all over Formula One. It's all over the bloody world. Um, but we can't buy it anywhere, but it is a new company. And when you have, when you raise money to launch a brand or, or a product, you have to do the marketing first. It's like fantastic. It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, like for example, um, with supermarkets, right? It, if you want to sell a product in a supermarket, they don't just test the product. They, they look at your marketing plan. And if it's shit, they're not interested. If you haven't got a national advertising campaign or an international one, they're not going to put it on their shelves. One of the interesting things is that you can, the, the barriers of entry into a different things. Yeah. And, and what they tend to do is suffocate creativity because you have yeah. this generic infrastructure that you have to satisfy. Yeah. And that's generally what stops people like me. So what I need is people who can play that game, who yeah. can go in and, and tick all these different boxes. And, you know, one of the you know, slight aside, but, you know, I said to you off camera, you know, I'm very cynical about this whole COVID fiasco. I think it's an absolute disgrace. I think yeah. in two or three years, most people will realise um, what's gone on. But one of the interesting things is that it's destroying and the reset that, you know, COVID is being harnessed for, um, is destroying small business, you know, and yeah. the corporates are proliferating and small stores and small business people are being put out of business. And so you're going to have this sort of generic world where you have to work with the big boys. I don't think that's yeah. very ethical, but I think that's the reality. So for companies like Rich Energy that are maybe unorthodox, creative, not playing by the usual rules um you know we we need to get a few people to to help us navigate that path but i think we're getting there you know and, and f1 you know f1 is i've said very corporate and very gray and very vanilla and you've got all these drivers who never say anything controversial who are just all if you like identikit robots and and you know i disagree with that but but ultimately the one thing in formula one and probably business everywhere the one thing that is absolutely one, two, and three in everyone's mind is money. Mm. And the bottom line is you've got the money, you can do what you want. And that, that yeah. is ultimately uh, true. Yeah, well, um, that's what Formula One was about, wasn't it? If you could afford to put a race team in, then, yeah. then off you go. Well, in the 80s, I think it was great because it was unencumbered with all this PC nonsense. You had the tobacco companies pumping in loads of money, you had the yeah. TV rights money, and it was just a gold era. You know, I think Bernie Eccleston was a brilliant deal maker who, 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 and raw, was, cool dude. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was, you know, again, came from nothing, understood, yeah. you know, Bernie Eccleston understands how things work, you know, and, and, and ultimately, whether you like him or whether you hate him, um, he can get deals done. And, and the biggest deal, which is not mentioned by anybody, the real reason that he ended up running Formula One was because he had the support of Enzo Ferrari, who basically allowed him to uh, sort of, uh, red carpet into the sport. So, yeah, interesting. Really interesting. And, and his legacy is obviously very visible yeah. throughout the sport now. Um, I think from what I've seen, there's going to be a lot of changes in, uh, Formula One, right? So the, how, how they fund teams and how much money is going in. What, yeah. What's actually changing? Is it going to be much more open for like smaller companies? Well, they've got a new more... bond, which actually would do the opposite of that because it would effectively, you know, it's a nine figure. Uh, you know, several hundred million dollar bond that you have to place as a new team, but they put in a caveat in the regulations which said can be waived if all the teams effectively agree, which basically I would read as wanting to keep outsiders out of the sport. Yeah. Um, so you're much better off doing a deal with an existing entity because then it's seamless, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Um, you know, Alfa Romeo and the sport, but basically it's the Sauber team. Yeah. Um, so what's, what are the regulations? Well, ostensibly it's to, 
cut, cut costs. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to have more homogenous engines. You're going to have simple, simpler regulations on chassis, on aero, basically meaning that a company that has a hundred or $150 million uh, budget is not at a massive performance disadvantage to say yeah. Mercedes who've got a 600 million or $500 million budget. Um, so it's trying to level the playing field and with the, advent of things like Formula E, which I think have a budget of five to ten million per team per year. You know, Formula One has got to be seen to be moving with the times. So it's basically about cost cutting and simplification to mean that it's a little bit more accessible to I can say ordinary people, but in terms of, you know, other other sort of motorsport people. Um and I and I think that's, you know, been a long time coming and it's become a bit more sensible. And you may well see the likes of Eddie jo- the Eddie Jordans of this world or Paul Stoddart's of this world coming back into the sports team owners because right now there's very few privateers they're all sort of yeah. corporate big corporations I do think that makes the sport a little bit dull 100% because I used to, and also these um, Eddie Jordans like you're like that kind of like kind of person because they'll come on and actually speak their mind a bit and make it a bit more interesting and especially with social media now um, you know only takes an Eddie Jordan or someone like you to say something funny or a bit controversial and then it's boom, it's across everywhere. And at the moment, like with Formula One, it's just meh. I mean, I, I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, we're a similar age, but, yeah. um, you know, when I was a kid, people like Nigel Mansell, Nigel Mansell was, you know, Alan the, Prost. The fat brummy, but, yeah. you know, Alan Prost, Senna. I mean, yeah. just before that, people like James Hunt, they, yeah. they were fun. You know, they were good guys, you know, and obviously you had Barry Sheen in motorbikes, et cetera, but yeah. you had loads of different characters in the sport. Yeah. And I just think it's just become too corporate. You know, it's yeah. too great. And, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. somebody like me yeah. is unemployable in yeah. a corporate environment yeah. because, I'm not going to do as I'm told. Yeah. I'm not going to go along with some woke nonsense. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to say what I think. And guess what? I'll probably do the job well. Yeah. Um, but if Formula One's become more corporate, it by definition becomes boring because there are rules and regulations for everything. And yeah. don't forget, freedom of speech is a key tenet of being British. Yeah. And actually, the, you know, it's a, it's a wider, deeper point, but actually the corporate world is almost suffocating free speech because you've got this very narrow, narrow band of acceptability. Yeah. I think Formula One's suffering from that. A hundred percent. It's probably why I don't watch it. Yeah. Because... I, I mean, genuinely it's become, I would say it has become boring as a spectacle. Yeah. I remain optimistic it can get back to, um, you know, yeah. where it was, but I speak with two hats. I still see the value for my brand of being plastered all over it. Yeah. Um, whether I choose to go and watch it ahead of a football match or a boxing match or a horse race, it was a different, different point, isn't it? You know, yeah. but it does for a, certainly for an energy drink, which is all about performance, you know, having a, uh, a black and gold car beating Red Bull, hopefully. Yeah. No, uh, is, cool. is Nirvana. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's, that is super cool. There is, that's the thing. That's what Formula One still holds on to. That, you know, they still have that audience. They, it, it's very glamorous. Yeah. Um, I've been They're in danger of losing point. it though. They, they need to get their act together. And I think they need to they reinvigorate to a younger audience, which I think they're starting to do. Um, yeah. You know. But I don't know. I'm not sure it's working though. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't think they're like hoarding new, um, no. you know, I mean, the average person watching Formula One is probably in their fifties now. Yeah. And that, and that's quite telling. Cause it used to be everybody. Yeah. Like literally yeah, everyone, yeah, yeah. kids watched it with their dads you know, their parents and their parents and the, you know, everyone would watch it. Yeah. Like you said, if it's going on Sky, that's massively disappointing because less people are getting Sky. Everyone's got Netflix now. Why would you pay a hundred quid a month to have Sky? Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's pointless. Obviously I have terrestrial channels. Um, but I don't even watch TV anymore. Well, ne- I mean, Netflix, you, you referenced it at the beginning of the chat, but Drive yeah. to Survive, I yeah. mean, that has been the most innovative, exciting yeah. content in Formula One in the last 15 years. Yeah. And it's taken a very, very successful, creative company like Netflix yeah. to almost reimagine the sport. And they've added in all the things that the, that Sky yeah. don't get, which is, you know, drama and characters and backstories yeah. and all the rest of it, which is, you know, obvious to you and I, but, yeah. you know, hopefully that, that comes on tap a little bit more. I would genuinely rather watch a season, yeah, a Formula One in the style of Drive to Survive, yeah, than watch it on TV. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I learned this in boxing because I went into boxing and, and same thing, you know, barriers of entry. I had all the big promoters not wanting me really in the sport. And obviously I had to sort of navigate my way through all of that. But 
the reality is they live in the dark ages. You know, it's a very shallow gene pool. Um, you know, not as bad as Formula One because it's got yeah. know, bigger, higher barriers of entry. And that's the thing. You know, once you get into yeah. Formula One, you realize the gene pool is quite shallow. Actually, yeah. there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. But, but boxing, you know, they don't realize it's the entertainment business and putting yeah. stuff behind a paywall is a disaster. And UFC, yeah. which is a modern, creative, innovative entertainment product, have made monkeys of, of, of boxing yeah. because they've exposed not only the huge appetite for combat sports yeah. and the huge commercialism of it, yeah. but just all of the things. They've almost given a blueprint of yeah. everything boxing hasn't been doing. Yeah. If you, I'm a huge UFC fan. I've got yeah. Dan Hardy on next week. Okay. You know Dan Hardy? I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, UFC fighter back yeah. in the day. Yeah. I saw him have a fight at um, uh, O2 Arena, um, but he's now he's a commentator. He's yeah. on the UFC fights. Yeah. Um always been a UFC fan. So when we were talking about um, Formula One earlier, if you look at UFC fighters as drivers, yeah, right, and then you compare them to actual Formula One drivers, what the UFC fighters talk about in interviews, and they're so raw, they're like, I'm going to knock this guy out, he's a douche, like blah, blah, blah. If that was back in Formula One, the whole world would watch it again. Mm. But the problem with Formula One is that as soon as you hear the question, you could literally write the answer. Well, I yourself, t- I, I, you already know. I totally so. agree with you, and and I was always coming up against you know the sort of nonsense PR department within <sighs> Haas that were utterly clueless, and they did not have a clue. But the interesting thing, and the problem that Formula One has to defend it slightly against that, is that when you've got corporate sponsors yeah. paying a lot of money, yeah, they don't necessarily want to be associated with somebody saying they're not going to knock somebody out. And yeah. one of the big problems yeah. that boxing has is that a lot of corporates don't want to be involved in the sport. And yeah. I brought a lot of corporate advertisers into boxing. I yeah. did huge deals with the likes of Bet Victor, Hublot Watches, yeah. big companies that I sort of persuaded to come into boxing. Yeah. Their marketing departments were always deeply reluctant to do it. Yeah. And I understood why, yeah. but yet the media value is massive. You know, boxing yeah. matches get watched again and again and again. People watch them. And, and and I love boxing also because I love betting on boxing but you know I, I've for UFC seems to me like a real life WWF yeah. you know or WWE as it yeah, now is yeah. it's a basically a circus it's a franchise and those guys are employees yeah. whereas in boxing they're self-employed so you can argue but, but I yeah. totally agree with you yeah yeah it's true it's a shame well hopefully it changes but they've been talking about Formula 1 changing for years and it hasn't yeah it's a tired moribund product yeah. that still despite its own management yeah. I don't want to slag them off too much, but despite its own management, is still there at the pinnacle yeah. because of historical reasons. And don't I, mean, I think Bernie Eccleston did do a superb job because I mean it yeah. makes me laugh if you look on the BBC website. And by the way, I think the BBC have just lost all credibility in the last year. They are just horrendously yeah. inaccurate news, yeah. Yeah. but propaganda tool. However, if you look at their website, Sport, which is a good website, yeah. let's give them some credit. Yeah. Um, Formula One, second to football on the list of sports and I think that's quite telling really yeah and that that's to me that that tells me the value of Formula One because ordinary people are still interested in it yeah whereas TT which we both think is amazing and other motorsports which yeah. are brilliant are very niche or are they or niche as they say in America yeah or are they or are they promoting Formula One as the second one because it's the most grey um, perhaps yeah, perfectly not, like not, PC not, not thought of it like that but there is. perhaps perhaps it would make sense I mean yeah. what other sport is more PC than yeah. Formula 1 nothing not many at the moment cricket no probably no, not they get shit faced no, on cricket, camera cr- cr- cricket's got some good characters yeah yeah exactly yeah. Um, talk about football yep um, are you buying Sunderland are you or like what, what's happening there because I know you put in a bid I think yeah. and you, you've been talking like you've had lots of interviews about buying Sunderland Football Club yeah. again who was someone on Netflix was it Netflix or Prime or something like that um, it followed their journey like uh, yeah there was I think they did something on Sunderland yeah I watched that yeah. fantastic Sunderland Till I Die I yeah Sunderland Till I Die amazing show um, so what's your plan there so unfortunately i lost that bid so no. uh, we put in a bid um which was i'm trying to think exactly when but a few you know a few months ago we put in a um, yeah. a bid and in fact initially it was in july and then we resubmitted in november yeah um 
And, you know, for me, Sunderland was, was and is an amazing football club. Yeah. I think it's the sixth largest fan base in the country. They, they've, uh, yeah. they are, you know, one of the top six or seven clubs in Britain. They've got an amazing stadium, an amazing fan yeah. base. Um, you know, and, and brilliantly knowledgeable fans, yeah. um, and an amazing history. And I just felt that they had huge potential and, you yeah. know, with the right management, the right team and the right investment, they could and will hopefully become yeah an absolute force again in football. They were languishing in and are languishing in League One. You know, yeah. for me, they're a natural Premier League club. Yeah. So bottom line, and I can talk much more openly about it now because it's, it's all, yeah. the denouement is done. But I mean, basically, we put in a bid, um, there or thereabouts, 35 million. Reasonable. Which is, you know, pretty cheap for a yeah. size of, uh, for a club of Sunderland size. They've obviously yeah. got various debts, et cetera. Yeah. I had uh, backing for an extra 50 million to invest in players on top. And, and we felt we had a plan and we had a brilliant group of people that I'd pulled together. I had some Sunderland fans. I had um, help from the ex-owner. Um, so I pulled together a good team. I just thought it was a really exciting opportunity. And I felt if I could get hold of Sunderland, I could propel it back to the Premier League. Um, yeah. And I'm a fanatical football fan growing up supporting West Ham. But yeah. I've always liked Sunderland. And, um, you know, unfortunately it wasn't to be uh, a 23 year old French billionaire, uh, picked me to the post. His dad used to own Marseille. He's based in Switzerland. Uh, the Louis, uh, the Dreyfus family. Right. Um, so they're worth, you know, 10 billion or something. And he, yeah. he's gone in and, uh, he's bought the club and good luck to him. You know, I, I think yeah. he seems like a nice g- kid yeah. and, um, I wish him all the best. And, and Sunderland fans deserve success. So it's, uh, I was very disappointed not to get it because I really did feel we could do amazing things there. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, it's an amazing club and I, and I will be. I wish them every success and I will go and see some games as well. If you could buy any football club in the UK, who would you buy? Well, it's just hands down West Ham because <laughs> I'm a West Ham fan. Um, and I think... Are know, they for sale? No. No. no if anyone no, out there, I would like to buy Swindon Town Football Club. Yeah. Right? Um, so if anyone out there can help me do that, let me know. And yeah. uh, well, I West, know, West Ham I, I announced know some... in the Champions League, I think we're fourth... Um, that, you know, um, I, I know the owners. I think yeah. they've done an amazing job. Yeah. Um, they're both, I mean, very rare in the Premier League these days. They're both English. Yeah. They're both, um, what about David Sharp, Welsh, but, but basically they're British owners. Yeah. Grew up as fans, local boys, yeah. working class kids who've made it and, and they love the club. And I yeah. think that they, Perfect. you know, in, a, in an era of American funds and, Arab shakes. So I think it's really refreshing. They, they are like old school owners. Yeah. And I hope their families take it on because they're, they're, um, they're brilliant people. Can you make money owning a football club or is it just a tax write off? Without question. I mean, I think 15 years ago, perhaps not so much. Um, but without a shadow of a doubt, I mean, the TV money now in, in the Premier League yeah. dwarfs ticket money. So I mean, you're, the average team in the yeah. Premier League is now getting 100 to 150 million pounds just on TV money. Um, so which will be two or three times gate revenue. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a, a good Premier League club has got a turnover of 200 million quid plus. Um, and yes, wages have gone up, et cetera, but without, without question. I mean, yeah. that, you know, that of course you can lose money if you don't do it right. Yeah. I mean, Tony Fernandez, of course, at QPR or, but the Glazers came in, used other people's money to buy Man United. They yeah. probably had 400 million pounds out in profit and they still own it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. if you get it right, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but obviously if you get it wrong and you, and you get relegated out of the Premier League, then you can catch a cold. Yeah. 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 That's the, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, the thing with the Premier League that I think a lot of people don't realize is that it's everywhere. I went to, I was in New Zealand and yeah. I was in a hotel next to the airport when I first got there. Um, and because I had an English accent, the guy behind the bar in the hotel was like, Oh, you're from England. Who do you support? And I was like, Chelsea. And he went, me too. And I was like, what? Yeah. But the thing, and I was like expecting Man United because normally you travel 10, 15 Glory years ago, sure. it, whoever's at the top of the league. And if it arrived in New Zealand in like 2008, they would Liverpool all, in the 80s. All, yeah. All support, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I got there, he was like, Oh, I love Chelsea. And I was like, really? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of Chelsea. When I was a kid, I don't really follow it now, but, um, 
Uh, yeah, I couldn't believe it. He liked Chelsea. Think, he gave me a free beer. I think there's an argument that actually the Premier League in the last 15 years has become Britain's most successful business export. Bar Easy. None. Easy. More people watch the Premier League in Thailand and China yeah. than in the whole of Europe. Yeah. You know, in America, it's one of the most popular TV things to watch. So yeah. it's massive. And the reason that Sky yeah. keep putting these crazy billions of pounds into football rights is because they're now worried, you referenced it earlier on, that the likes of Amazon and Netflix will will go after those rights. I mean, it is the best media product out there. Yeah. And now, if you're in situ as a Premier League football club or owner, yeah. it's a cash cow. There's no there's no question about that. And eventually, because I, if I watch football now, I watch highlights. But then I'd have to, I have to watch it on the right time for BBC. I'm not a BBC iPlayer person. Yeah. But if Netflix had a weekly roundup of Premier League football... Yeah. I'd watch it because you spend half your if time you figuring out what to Premier what. League club pre two thousand and ten. Yeah. Then on average, I looked at these figures. On average, you'd be looking at a four hundred percent appreciation in value in a decade. Over that, yeah. So if you paid a hundred million quid for a club, yeah, it's now worth four hundred million on average. If they stayed in the Premier League, though. Yeah, assuming that they did. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you get the parachute payments. I mean, Sunderland would be conversely. You know, the guy lost money. Yeah. Uh, you get relegated. But if you, you know, if you're, if you're solid in the Premier League, then, then, you know, it, you've got an amazing, um, revenue stream just from yeah. the, the TV revenue, which is interestingly why Premier League clubs are not reporting a massive yeah. downturn from COVID. Because yeah. actually the fans, whereas they used to be 80 or 90% of the revenue. Yeah. Now they're probably less than 20%. Exactly. And that'll keep going down. Over time, probably. Probably. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the international audience. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an auction for all the international rights, aren't they? Yeah. So, if I wanted to buy Swindon Town Football Club, yep. what's your advice? <laughs> Knock on the door and ask them for sale. I mean, they'd probably sell to you. would be delighted. I mean, at that sort of level, you know, football clubs don't make much money at all. He'd probably be very happy to sell to you. I mean, I'd, um, I'd guess you'd probably pick the club up for, if you took on the debts, um, Five million quid. Five, seven mil. Yeah, if that. Because cause ultimately, yeah. where where's the money? You know, mo- most people, business people, at that sort of level, it's property deals, you know. Yeah. They, is, is, the, is the ground worth selling for property? I mean, I yeah. think that's disgraceful, by the way. Yeah. Um, but that is the reality. I mean, you had yeah. Brighton at the Goldstone ground. They had an owner, Bill Archer, I think, who, who famously um, basically just sold the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, so... and. Yeah, so I would say probably five million quid, yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be about five to seven. Knock on the door, they're probably absolutely delighted. Yeah, um, Oscar, can you quickly Google who owns Swindon Town Football Club? I really, I would like to they've buy had, it. They've had, I mean, Glenn Hoddle, Paolo De Canio, some fantastic people down there. And they yeah. have, of course, been in the Premier League. I think they Dude, were I the lowest there. ever points team yeah. in the Premier League. I went to the 1990 playoff. Okay. Yeah, where we beat... Was Hoddle um, the manager then? Hoddle, no, Ozzy Ardiles. Was orig- and then it was Glenn Hoddle. We went yeah. to the playoffs again and we won. But the Ozzy Ardiles one, I don't know if you remember what happened. No. But we beat, oh shit, is it Swindon? I can't remember who we beat for some reason. We won 1 0, but there was a whole controversy. I can't remember what it was. Either they spiked their, their drinks and they couldn't play or something random. Sure, but we, it, we got thrown out. We got thrown out at the top well, of the there league. have been, there, actually, I think the, the former owner of Swindon used to live on Richmond Green. Obviously, I live in Richmond. Um, and I'm pretty sure the former owner used to live in Richmond. I think there's been a lot of shenanigans at Swindon, actually. I think they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're a club that have had a few colourful owners. Yeah. Um, owner of Swindon Town Football Club is Lee Power. So if Lee anyone knows Power. Lee Power, I think he owns a couple of other clubs, like one in like Africa and stuff. Strict clubs. No, 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 not strict. Maybe. I don't know. But, um, if anyone knows Lee Power, tell him that John wants to buy Swindon Town Football Club and maybe we'll make this happen. Yeah, it could be a little side project. Certainly for you. help you. Will, no will, will Rich Energy sponsor the, the if ground? If you're the owner, we will 100% sponsor you. How much? Two mil? Well, we'll have to sit down. <laughs> How much is a sponsorship I'm for not, a football club? I'm not a perpetual philanthropist. <laughs> um, that would be epic because I'm from that area. That's my um, nice part of the world. Lovely. And, yeah, Wiltshire is beautiful. Who are um, West Country? Not that far. Okay, it's getting there. Uh, you're more sort of towards Bristol way. But we're 40 minutes before. Okay. If you Chippenham leave from London. Way? Chippenham's further, much further. Devices? Uh, not far, okay. yeah. yeah. Marlborough, do you know yeah, Marlborough? Know, yeah. That's five minutes. Amesbury, a place like that. Yeah, yeah, around there, yeah. yeah. I know um, where you are. But no, I thought Stop about this. Stockbroker belt. 
I don't know, I don't know. I'm but you, when um, I first like discovered you through James more so, obviously I saw you on Netflix, um, and I was looking at football clubs and stuff, and I was like, yeah, like for rich people, that's like a property deal, five to ne- five to seven million. Yeah. But um, oh, there have been some absolute horror have. stories of owners in football clubs, and it's yeah. uh, Portsmouth's another example. Um, you know, it's a, yeah, what? I'd say it's a it, it's it's a funny sport. I mean, yeah. but you know, for me, you know, it's sort of. It, it, it's almost a bygone era now, isn't it? You know, because yeah. the Premier League is now this very corporate, Untouchable. polished asset, if you yeah. like. Yeah. And I think what will happen, unfortunately, but I think it's inevitable, is that yeah. Americans and corporate America is very, very interested in franchises and sports sure. rights. Yeah. And I think they see the Premier League as a huge cash cow. It wouldn't yeah. surprise me if a few clubs change hands in the next year or so. Yeah. And I think you pro, unfortunately, you might get a stage where you know, there are no British owners in the Premier League um, yeah. in the not too distant future, which I think would yeah. be a shame. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be. Um, but we used to, back in the day when I was younger, it, it was most of the players were English. And then when we started, I remember it was like Arsenal that had the first team out in the Premier League that were all foreign. Yeah. You know, and under it, Wenger. Yeah, under Wenger, yeah. And it was like, and there's not. And then they were like, there's not well, they one. They used to have a six person rule, didn't they, in the Champions League? Or yeah. The, yeah. Something like that. Uh, European Cup. So, I yeah. That's three now. But, but, but you, know, you know, the thing is, it, it's now definitive. When I was a kid, and I'm a failed footballer, by the way, you know, yeah. so I mean, I got as far as QPR reserves. And I always wanted to, from, from five to 21, all I wanted to do was be a footballer. Yeah. Um, but, but the interesting thing was in, in those days is that Syria, ah, or the, the, the Spanish league Gaza. were, were sort of, if you like, number one and two. Yeah. And I think in the last 10 years, the Premier League is now Dwarfed. the dominant yeah. football league worldwide, which, which is yeah. an incredible achievement for UK football. So if yeah. you look at it like that, you know, if you've got, doesn't matter if they're all from Brazil, yeah. you know, the reality is they're the best team in the world. What Man City have done, yeah. I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hats off to them. Well, the Premier League just goes to show that all the managers that have come over, they're all they're the best managers in the world, and yep. you say about the two hundred million turnover, that like well, a lot the, of clubs are a lot more than that, of course. But I mean, that's probably sure. the average, yeah. Um, but the Premier League draws so many players now that you'll get more value out of player prices than you yeah. would have back in the day, yeah. Because you'd have had to try and get them from Real Madrid or wherever. Yeah. But now, I mean, the, pre- the Premier League is probably now the number one product yeah. in world sport, yeah. And 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 as an overall value, it's number one. And, and I, and I can't see that changing. And, and that's, you know, you've got to take your hats off to the people running British football because they've yeah. managed to get into that position. Yeah. It's cool. Um, maybe I'll buy Swindon Town Football Club. Yeah. But they've got a fan base of 12,000 or something. So I mean, the ceiling. I'll change that. Okay. I'll yeah, just yeah. do the marketing for it. Well, I'd use, I'd just YouTube and vlog the whole thing. And so everyone will know. Like what goes we'll get on them behind all drinking the scenes. Rich energy, and I'm sure they'll get in the Premier League night in no time. Well, we just done a sponsorship deal, haven't we? There you like, go. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> That'd be epic. Um, talk about sponsorship. Um, when you sponsor a Formula One team, once you've done all the boring paperwork and argued about values, all this kind of stuff, um, do you just get to enjoy it? Do you get to just go and enjoy it, or or do you actually have to like do a lot of work? Um, well, I did. I mean, you know, I, I went to every race and, uh, you know, had, had fun. I mean, you know, yeah. as far as I, as far as I was concerned, 95% of it is being there. Yeah. You know, our, yeah. my brand was on the side of the car, was in the team name, was getting plastered everywhere. And you also, you also, so I just interrupt, but you also have incredible hospitality suites you're known yeah. for, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, corporate cool hospitality in F1 is probably the best in world sport, I would yeah. suggest. Yeah. Um, but I think the new, again, going back to corporate regulations, the new rules on corporate hospitality and tax benefits, et cetera, have actually meant that I think that suffered somewhat, um, yeah. to be honest. I think Paddock Club, which used to be an absolute cash cow. Um, in fact, I think the guy who um, took the rights to Paddock Club from Bernie Eccleston sold out for about 400 million, Paddy McNally. No way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you, you, typically people are paying thousands of pounds to go and watch a race. Um, but yeah, the hospitality is very, very good. Obviously, it's great to, to entertain people. But I listen. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a snob. I, I don't really care about all that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'd rather eat in a greasy spoon than the Ritz. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just not bothered by that sort of stuff. However, um, you know, I'm not most people, and certainly all of our guests very much enjoyed it. Um, it's good fun, you know. But I mean, I, 
it, you like all, all hospitality. I mean, the British superbikes, world superbikes, but no, Formula One is, is really good. Yeah. In terms of the, there's, of course, a lot to do around it. activation and promotion yeah. and inviting corporate partners to race and everything. But, you know, I tried to sub out as much of that as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, which, which worked pretty well. So going back into like a fresh slate, uh, for 2022. Yeah. Um, what would you say the biggest things, apart from all the noise you talked about, the law stuff and that, what would, what would be the biggest things that you learned from the first, um, stint, the first stage of sponsoring Formula One to what you're going to take into this one? You've got to, you've got to have the product widely available. Right. Um, because there is no point in flag waving to, you know, hundreds of millions of people if they can't get the product. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you know, I sort of turbocharged, pardon the pun, the growth. So we went from, tiny startup to serious brand yeah. in almost no time at all. And then yeah. you're sort of backfilling, trying to scale up. Yeah. So, you know, have in place the right infrastructure to be able to deal with that demand and make sure that when you announce yourself, um, that it's already widely available. Yeah. That was the biggest problem because we were playing catch up on distribution. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, the value was growing anyway. So the, the model and the strategy was working. Yeah. But had we been available in Tesco's and Sainsbury's and BP petrol stations, et cetera, then also it would have removed any of the questions about us. Cause a lot of people were saying, Oh, does rich energy exist? Where can I get it? Yeah. Questioning what we were doing. Yeah. So I said, you know, we are unorthodox. You know, I created it. It was a blank piece of paper. I didn't follow any past models from any other beverage companies. I had yeah. no interest in what other people were doing. Yeah. I just focused on what our plan was. And, you know, there's no substitute for common sense. This is what yeah. – it's quite an interesting thing. People think I can't do that because I haven't studied that or I haven't got qualifications in it. It doesn't matter. If you've got common yeah. sense and yeah. you're prepared to work hard, just do it. Yeah. Because most experts are clueless in my experience. I mean yeah. – you know, that, that's genuinely true. And, uh, you know, a smart person with limited knowledge is better than an idiot who's read a million books. Yeah. And so just apply common sense. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, the, the distribution. That's the thing, like, with Rich Energy, it's sponsoring this Formula One team, a pinnacle sport all over the world, yeah. but they couldn't physically be part of the brand. So you create the brand, mm. but they couldn't be part of it by having a drink yeah. of it. There was, like, a, there was a, there was, you know, you've got to be self-critical to improve. Yeah. And I think you've got to be able to identify weaknesses. And we definitely had a lot of weaknesses, but there was a, there was a, the, the disconnect between our brand growth and our operating business mm -hmm. was too big. Yeah. And we need, you know, now I've got the right partners to be yeah. able to do all of that. And, and we were sort of, it, it was working, yeah. but it was too slow. We, we should have had distributors in 60 countries. Day one, when we raced in, uh, in Australia in, yeah. in March 19, we didn't, you know, yeah. so we were, and, and, and our operating team was too small. I mean, in effect, yeah. rich energy was me and a handful of people yeah. doing everything. Yeah. And so there, there comes a point where you have to scale up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So, and that, so that's happening now as we speak. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So we've got the right, you know, functions of the business like distribution are effectively you know separate and, yeah and then they become accountable and they're run properly you know but and then you don't have to worry about that so two questions then um when will the the new market in and the new um sponsorship start for formula one and also if someone was to see this and want to distribute rich energy yeah how do they do it okay well Point number two first, yep. go to richenergy.com or yep. contact us on social media, yep. um, Twitter or Instagram, but richenergy.com, you know, there's a contact us. Anyone, yep. you know, wants to distribute it, we're delighted to talk to them. Yep. Um, point number one or question number one is that the team will announce our partnership and that that is fine being discussed at the moment as to when that is because the car's not black and gold this year. And this year, no, it's not black and gold this year, and we're not in the team name. So, can we say what team it is? No, not yet. Okay, no, but <laughs> it, it may well be that Monaco in May is when we actually do a sort of big relaunch. Yeah, because if we're only a tiny bit on the car, there's no point in in making a big thing of it so, right now. Yeah. Um, but the main thing is for 2022 that everything is is in place, so it's the rich energy dot 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 team. Um, and that we're, you know, we're right back in and, and it's quite exciting. I mean, I, I think the rich energy now is, um, you know, I think it's 
almost inevitable that we are going to be a world leading brand in the energy drink sector, um, you know, in the coming 18 months. And that's, you know, that's good, you know, uh, yeah. and, um, you know, when we sell the billionth can, I'll come back here and, uh, have another chat with you. Yeah. I think, um, looking at the resilience of the company in the last sort of 18 months and what it did the 18 months before that. Yeah. And it's still, a, still about to go on this massive explosion again. It shows that it's got legs. It shows it's going to go because if it can get through all that, yeah, and it comes out and you're back in well, Formula you can't, One. Well, you can't beat a man who never gives up, and you can't beat uh, a brand that is determined to succeed and yeah. has, you know, if the product is the best out there, yeah. it will win. But you know, it can be a circuit, circuitous route. You know, it's, yeah. it's strange. It's all, it's all a, um, a lesson. But you know, I think in the mo- one of the things that's really good about the new business world and i think consumers are much more attuned to authenticity i think they they actually really like that people who are genuine and not just generic yeah um and i think you know we're different but we're we are what we are and i think you know we're we're proud of our product and the brand and and hopefully more consumers get to try it and see what you uh see what you thought when you tried it yeah and that's the thing like say say for example red bull launched now and Rich Energy launched now, and they were both on Formula One, and they had the guy with the beard talking about Rich Energy and a bit of bit contra- controversial, or whatnot, whatever people yeah. think. What are you going to look at? You're going to tr- you're going to go. With well, I don't Rich think it's anything to do with me. I mean, I I, I personally think it. You know, we have, bit, we have the, we have the we have the products and the brand, and and, yeah. and we're we're a better product than the competition, and that and that's the key thing, you yeah. know. And um, also, you know. Red Bull, you know, I, I'm, I've actually got a court order, so I'm uh, restricted in what sure. I can say. But, yeah. you know, let's rephrase it elegantly. Yeah. Corporate brands out there yeah. who may or may not be in our sector um, are quite hubristic. They're quite arrogant. You know, yeah. they, they, they treat distributors not particularly well. You know, that they, they, they have this arrogance that everyone's automatically going to stock them. Yeah. Um, and so actually there's a lot of people are very receptive nightclub groups casinos supermarkets are actually quite receptive to a brand that are really keen to work with them that aren't yeah. arrogant that actually want to offer you know a better deal better commercial so i think there is an opportunity um it's like any business isn't it you know if you, if you can do what you do better than the competition hopefully yeah you, you can get some joy hopefully but um that reminds me of what happened to virgin cola yeah do you know what happened there I remember, I remember studying it when I was at uni. Um, and, uh, Richard Branson obviously had a, wanted to compete with Coca Cola. Mm. Um, and what happened was, is that he launched a product, Virgin Cola. It was really good, tastes good. Um, but what he didn't realize is that when he wanted to put it into every single shop around the world, Coca Cola own all the fridges. Yeah. So they were like, you can go fuck yourself if yep. you think we were putting Virgin Cola in our fridges. Yep. And then they told all the retailers that if you put Virgin Cola on the stores, we're going to, cause they own Sprite, yep. they own all the, all the drinks. So they turn around and were like, if you put Virgin Cola mm. into a retailer that we're in, we're taking all of ours out. Well, we, we've come up against that and yeah. Coca Cola do own a huge swathe of fridges and mm. definitely there's, you're not coming in, your name's not on the door yeah. and they are resistant to change and yeah. they're resistant to new brands. However, they have to be careful because it's a fine line with anti-competition. Yeah. And so therefore, if you have, how they tend to do it is that the say eight companies that say in Notria and Co, um, bid food, yeah. um, big wholesalers. Yeah. And in effect, they're resistant to stocking brands like ours. So what we tend to do is then do deals direct with the, with the outlets. So yeah, you're a hundred percent. There's a huge amount of. I wouldn't phrase it as protectionism because protectionism is officially not allowed, but de facto there is. So yeah, those are the things you've got to navigate. And I remember yeah. going to all the nightclub groups, didn't want to know because if they get a big retro from Red Bull or whatever, then they're, they're not interested. So that's the sort of commercial real politic, yeah. but it needs to be driven by consumers. One, yeah. one of the interesting developments, I think it's a very positive development is look how the music industry has changed with you know, you had MTV and then the big record companies were very arrogant. They didn't see how it was going to change. With YouTube, in effect, an artist could create a, a fan base yeah, without so the, the, the support or ownership of a record company. So yeah. it became a little bit more meritocratic. Yeah. And then it becomes consumer driven. If yeah. people like Rich Energy and they've tried it, we want to get Rich Energy. Yeah. 
the outlets are almost forced to stock it. And that's yeah. how you want to approach it. But, you know, we, we're not going to be disingenuous. We are a small David versus the Goliath of the drinks industry. Yeah. But it's quite a fun challenge to try and get yeah. in and around, you know, like yeah. a speedboat and a sea of oil tankers. We've got to use that agility yeah. and enthusiasm and speed yeah. as an advantage. Yeah, I actually did a lot of studying into energy drinks back in the day. Um, cause I remember when, cause one of the advertising campaign I studied was give, gives you wings, Red Bull gives you wings. Um, and I think w- one success story that is incredible in the energy drinks, um, industry is five hour energy. And what, and what he did is he created an energy drink that was different to everything else. But the way he sold it, he sold it where you would buy like a cigarette lighter in a service station. So it, it, he aimed it at truck drivers, drivers that he just positioned wanted, it in a niche, positioned it yeah. perfectly, and and he, they created they created a pack that would just sit on the side, and people would buy it in America. I remember doing it myself when I was on the mob back in the day. Yeah, you would, and it literally works five hours, but it's a, literally a shot. They packaged it different to anything else out there. The USP was different. Um, I think he sold it for billions, but like absolutely billions. That company. Yeah. Would you mind googling how much he sold yeah. five hour energy for? Um, but that's what he did. And so, so he took on the big energy drinks by re- refashioning how it was sold. Yeah. You know, and that, like, that's the, obviously that was the main challenge for him to get it out there. Which effectively created a subsector of a very large market. Yeah. That, I mean, taking on the status quo in any sector. Yeah. Let alone the energy drinks, any consumer brand sector is by definition a tall order. Yeah. Um, and, and the examples like Caribou, Carabao, whatever, they, they are effectively, um, the opposite of rich energy. You know, they've spent 500, 600 million failing to launch a Red Bull competitor. I think we're the opposite. But, um, as I say, you've got to just keep, keep plugging away. But I think if you're very passionate about it and you know you've got the best product in the market, then there's a confidence that comes from that. And, um, you, you just got to keep pushing. But it's, it, it's a really exciting, you know, market. It's an yeah. 80, 90 billion a year market. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I love, consumer brands and i think you know the words rich and the words energy yeah. are very resonant yeah. black and gold is very resonant you've got the stag from richmond park which is very british yeah. so you know lots of elements of this work yeah um the key is to get it into the hands of consumers which is yeah obviously what we're doing it's an exciting time it's yeah. a, it's, it's it's right fun. it's right at the beginning. i'm excited yeah i'm um, just reading that the guy did a billion in sales you yeah. know in a market that was like you know um, yeah. Well, I think one, one thing you, you surprise you because uh, business is, you know, all about money, etc. Is that money's not my motivator. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm not interested in money, and that's yeah. I find that quite unusual because everyone I deal with in commerce is is the opposite to me because they're they're obsessed with money, yeah. and I'm not really interested. But when you're not interested, you can take risks and you yeah. can do experiment with things, do different things. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it, it's having fun and trying to build something is, it's, it's an enjoyable journey. You've got to enjoy every yeah. day. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same. It's the challenge is what I find mm. the fun in. And I, I think you're similar. Um, the fact that that guy did a billion dollars wouldn't have been his priority at the beginning. It would have been getting a cool company but, out but when, there. But when, when all these massive corporates and all these billionaires want yeah. to block me from getting into Formula One, yeah. they're doing me a massive favor because of course, of course I'm going to get there and I'm going to enjoy doing it. You know, and people, you know, I'm sure you're like that. If people tell you you can't do something, then you're going to do it. And, and there's no bigger motivation than that, you know, and, uh, yeah. it, it's, but, but, you know, you just got to, I think it's really important to work with lovely people yeah. and, and have a sort of family atmosphere because life is short, you know, and you want to, you want really good people around you. And I think that's the, that, that can make the difference if you've got a great team of people yeah. and just be very authentic, you know, and uh, try and embrace, you know, everyone's different. Nice words. I'm sounding very nice there, aren't I? <laughs> See, I'm, I think I've brought the genuine side out of you. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, people might read something or, you know, see something and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, most entrepreneurs are, don't really do it for the money. The ones I know anyway, personally. It's more about the challenge. There's a value. There's a passion in there. Um, well, I think, I think the, I mean, there's so many different things. It's such an expansive subject, but I think you've got to, winners aren't scared of losing. Yeah. I think you've got to be prepared to lose and lose and lose and lose. And, yeah. and, and, 
and then you'll win. You know, I think a lot of people are scared of competing because their psyche is too fragile to handle defeat. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a tremendous handicap. You know, it's a bit yeah. like, you know, let's say I love women, which I do, right? So I love women. Well, if you've got some 10 out of 10 supermodel, right? Yeah. In my experience, most blokes won't ask her out. I'll ask her out every single time, you know, and nine times out of 10, they might say, you know, we're not into ZZ top look lights or whatever it might be. But one out of 10, well, boom, you know, and yeah. it, you know, you might have a 30% hit rate. Who knows? But the reality is it's a numbers game, however good or uh, you are, you know, so yeah. you've got to be, you've got to be prepared to taste failure yeah. to experience winning. And I, and I think that's, it's a philosophy, you know, your, somebody else's perception shouldn't affect your self perception. Yeah. And the moment you're not bothered, actually you're halfway to being successful because yeah. you're liberated from, from all the handicaps of worrying what other people are going to think, you know, so yeah. I think that's, you know, that's, that's the key thing. Yeah. There's a saying, um, if someone doesn't like you, it's because you highlight an insecurity in them. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I mean, you know, I think if you get really philosophical, in a zen. Are we going philo philosophical? I hope not, but well, we could do. But in a zen. Edit some music in. <laughs> in a, yeah, get some classical on. But no, you know, just in a zen, you know, just being very happy in yourself. True happiness comes from within. Yeah. And if you're happy in yourself, then you're oh, happy. You yeah. know, and, and, you know, whether you've got a push bike or a Ferrari, it doesn't matter. None of those things matter. Yeah. If you love life and you really you know, are happy in yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is probably a little bit wider, but I do think that the majority of people externalize happiness. They think that, you know, having a Rolex, having a, a Ferrari, having a big hat, whatever it might be that yeah. they want yeah. makes them happy. It doesn't, you know, the, the no. fundamental thing that makes you happy is, is inner peace, if you like. And yeah. that sounds a bit ridiculous, but I think if you've got that, then you can do anything. Because yeah. guess what? Whatever the short term problem you might have. I mean, so for example, you know, a lot of people are, are scared of, you know, I don't know, getting locked up or whatever it might be that, that, you know, they're going into the military or going to war or whatever. But you, you deal with all of that. You know, yeah. I think it's, it, you, you'd see that as a challenge. So how, yeah. how you, how you see anything yeah. is, it, you know, you, you can choose your attitude on yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's the attitude is attitude. Yeah. And I, yeah. And also I think you're talking about content as well, being content. Yeah. I think there's an element as most people aren't content. I feel like I've got to being content in the last sort of three years, Yeah, you know, where I'm like, Oh, I'm content, you know, where you, you go for your day, you're not fussed about anything. Mm -hmm. You kind of only do what you want to do. And you know, if there's value or there's a challenge or you're passionate, yeah. these things come like a lot later, like young people that are starting companies now that are like 16, 18, 21, 25 that message me all the time. Um, they're in the earliest stage of that, like content it, it like you don't need know how to plan for it. Yeah. So when you talk about that or I do, and we, we talk about, um, you know, just the way we're talking now that it's actually, I think it's hard for someone younger to understand that. Until it happens to them. Well, I think, you know, oh, people you should be liberated from worrying about what other people think. Cause I think yeah. that's a massive handicap. And the moment you're doing things for you is the moment you're halfway to getting there. Because yeah. I think a lot of people will actually balk or stop doing something because they're worried about what their mates think or what yeah. this group will think or how they'll be judged. And that is yeah. just completely irrelevant. And, what, and one of the great tragedies of life is that actually for a lot of people is that most people, in my experience, spend a huge, a disproportionate amount of time worrying about things that are utterly irrelevant. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, whether you get to 90 or 100 or 80, you know, your, your time is finite. So try and make yeah. the most of it and yeah. do things that you love, you know, do things that you're passionate about, embrace, you know, uh, all those things. Cause there's so many wonderful things out there. Yeah. And, and, and life can be unbelievably rich, pardon the pun, but it is what, you know, it is what you make it. And it's yeah. a blank page. I mean, I, I said to, I made some speech at some school and they asked me to give some advice to sort of 11 year old or, you know, a 15, 16 year old kids, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and I, I just came up with something which I thought was quite good, which I basically said that everyone's born with a, a blank canvas and a paintbrush. I've said the same. And, you know, you yeah. paint your own painting and yeah. you can paint an absolute masterpiece. Yeah. 
The real tragedy is most people give the paintbrush and the canvas to somebody else in their early 20s, and they're not in charge of their own destiny at that stage. And that's where I think you get a lot of people in their 50s who are unhappy because, you know, they've got divorced, they've been, you know, they've gone down a path of working for people they don't like and yeah. a job they didn't like to yeah. fund somebody they ended up didn't like, you know, yeah. didn't like. Yeah. And, and, and that's it, you know, that, that you only get one shot at it. It's not a dress rehearsal. So I think you've got to try and just be true to yourself, do what you love. Yeah. And the irony is if you do what you love, you're likely to be successful and money will you, follow. But, yeah. but it wasn't about money. You know, I mean, yeah. when, I when I was at university, you know, virtually all of my friends were desperate to go and work for Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch yeah, and Morgan yeah. Stanley and all these big corporates. And and I left, you know, to travel around Africa. I used to do loads of different things. I had no money in my 20s at all. Yeah. I was working in absolute shitty jobs, but fuck all. Yeah. For, in many cases, absolute tits. Yeah. But I was learning all the time. And I, I was fun. Know, and my, my mates at university were earning 10 times more than me. Yeah. 10 times more than I had. No, I was potless. Yeah. And then got to about 32. And I started overtaking them all. And, and. It's exactly what happened to me. And, and, but, You're but, literally but, talking. But it was never, but, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. You know, it's the university life, isn't it? You know, and, and I think that exposure to, if you were asking me to give advice to sort of young people who wanted to know about business, I would say try and do as many things as you can. Yeah. Get exposure to as many things and as many people as possible. Yeah. And you'll learn from what they do right. And, and, you, and you'll see what people do wrong. You know, and I, and I think, you know, I, I'm quite proud that all the people who work with me, as many of them work with me for 10, 15, 20 years because they like working with me because yeah. I want them to succeed. It's about them. You know, I, all my staff, I want to earn the maximum amount of money. It gives me great pleasure yeah. to see my young sales guys driving Porsches. It's not because I like Porsches. I don't, but. I know that for a 26, 27 year old guy to be driving a Porsche yeah. is brilliant. That's great. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a decent motor until I was about 30, you yeah. know, and, uh, well, 28, but, but, but you know what I mean? It, 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 I remember the thrill of, of getting a company car and stuff like that, you know, and so yeah. I think, I think, you know, if you, if you try and make everyone around you really successful, almost yeah. by definition, you'll become more successful, but it, yeah. it comes from a place of actually wanting to help people. And I think it costs nothing to be nice. And a lot of people don't realize that. They, they think you've got to be ruthless or you've got to yeah. be this, you've got to be that. I, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I think you can be really nice to people yeah. and very genuine and do well. Yeah. I you, Literally, I'm the same. Like I, like I, my company, Amica, like the fitness equipment company, started with my best friend since I was 10. There used to be a nightclub in Kensington called Amica, by the way. Did there? Is it A-M-I-K-A? I-C-A. Oh, okay. It's Latin okay. for okay. strength and courage. Okay. Um, but yeah, no. And like my whole goal, although I've invested in it and he runs the company, my goal is, cause I know his kids, obviously, he's missing. Like my goal with that is for him to buy a much bigger house, hopefully down the line and move his family in and they're happy. Yeah. Like that's my actual goal. Yeah. Like that's it, brilliant. It's not I mean, that, to make but money, that's, but that's noble, isn't it? You know, and, and I if, get value out of that though. Yeah. If I can help that happen, you know, mm. it will, I'll lay, I'll lay, yeah. you know, but, but I think it's all about the motivations. A lot of people do the wrong things for the right reasons. A lot of people yeah. do the right things for the wrong reasons, but I always think it's not what you do. It's why you do it. If it yeah. comes from a place of that's good, then I yeah. think it's great, you know, and you know, probably a topical example would be, Bill Gates investing in vaccines. Does that come from a genuine desire to help people or does that come from a desire to make a lot of money? I'll leave you to judge that, but I think I know the answer. It's a no-brainer. And, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, th there are people who perception and reality are very different. And there's yeah. a lot of people I know who are, who get terrible PR. They're yeah. deemed controversial or whatever. And actually they're the nicest, most generous, decent people you'll ever meet. There's a lot yeah. of people who are, noted philanthropists and lovely people who get wonderful PR who are the most selfish, unpleasant, Absolutely. greedy people you'll ever Absolutely. meet. So I never judge a book by its cover and I think you've got to get to know people and, um, you know, it's, it's, that's experience, isn't it? And I think, you know, most people I think are very naive. They don't understand human nature. They don't really understand what it's all about and they are constantly playing to someone else's tune. And, um, you know, that, you know, if I would give one advice to any aspiring businessman is work really hard, learn as much as you can from as many people. You can't just suddenly start a business. You, you need to gain experience of something and become excellent at it and then do something that you're better than other people have. Yeah. But, 
you know, by your early 30s, yeah. you don't really want a boss. Yeah, totally. I always say that if, if, if it's something you love and enjoy, do it. And eventually you'll make money out of it because you'll figure out, cause it, when you, yeah, cause when good. you, when you start a company, like you could start a rich energy, you will end up making more money out of side deals that you never even knew existed on yeah. day one of the business plan. Right. You know, you might end up doing a commercial deal somewhere down the line, somewhere else. And you'd be like, oh, I've made 50 million out of that. Yeah. And you would never have known that. Well, so the, the, the bizarre is thing is it. that some of the best deals you'll ever do come from nowhere and you weren't yeah. even expecting them. And all yeah. the deals you were expecting don't happen. You know, you, you look at, you look at a list of prospects. I mean, you know, I've got a technology company now with yeah. that assistant, which I'm very excited about yeah. that is absolutely flourishing. But the irony is it was conceived as one thing in three technology sectors. Yeah, yeah. Two of those haven't worked, but one has exploded. Yeah. So the irony is that, but we had to be there. We had to Fine. be in, we had to be in it to win it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's how it goes. Well, this is from boxing. You're in a perfect the, example. In, exactly. If you wouldn't have done the boxing thing, which yeah. was more passion and the side yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. This wouldn't have happened. Well, it's like the old sliding doors thing, isn't it? You know, one it fascinated one turn left rather than right, and your yeah. whole life is changed. You, you meet one woman and you're married to her for thirty years. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fascinating how it goes, but I think you know you've got to put yourself out there and just enjoy what you do. That's you know? it. It's fun for me. You know, in a way, I'm sort of thinking, fucking hell, I've got this consumer brand yeah. that is almost limitless yeah. that I can sell billions of units on. I yeah. can take on the big boys. Yeah. And genuinely, I'm offering consumers something that's better than what's available. Yeah. Well, you know, the only, no people, the only people who lose are my competition. Yeah. Great. So the advice is, just get out there and do it. Exactly. Just do it. With a smile on your just face. Just do it, Nike. With, with, <laughs> with a smile on your face. And have fun, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I should buy Swindon Town Football Club. Yeah, but also take advice from those who are, who know their onions. I would say, if, again, if you're doing it for love and passion, great. That's what I would but be doing. But if you're doing it to make money, I would, I would advise you not to. I'm going to show you a picture of when I was 10 years old. I'm with my mum at Wembley and I'm holding one of those big hands that says Swindon Town Football Club on it. Okay. I'll show you. Brilliant. And if I was to somehow, I mean, this is just hypothetical, be the owner of Swindon Town Football Club, that picture would be on the wall, me and my mum. Yeah. Well, the thing is, when I buy a big club, you can be the feeder club, can't you? Swindon can be uh, our how, feeder how club. How day? We'll be in the Premier League. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Within three years, we'll be in the Premier League. It's a nice club, though, so, and it's a lovely yeah. part of the world, Swindon. Yeah. It's on the Very M4. Well. Yeah, it's perfect. perfect. I've yeah. got a house around there. Lovely stuff. Yeah. Lovely stuff. So maybe well, you're, you're, you're like West Ham. Well, you know, but Swindon <laughs> is going to have a very trendy owner who's obviously on point with the... Uh, <laughs> with the, the young'uns, if you like. And, uh, you know, we'll have an old dinosaur in charge of a West Ham. You can loan me some players that you don't need. Every now and again. Well, absolutely. Or I can Free loan you charge, some. Because I'm a philanthropist. When I'm in the Premier League and you own, I don't know, some random club, yeah. I'll have to send you well, some. One of my I'll hook you up. One I'll of my little gags is that um, I'm people say, well, what am I? And I say, I'm a philanthropist. Yeah. But I'm a dyslexic philanthropist because right. I'm a philanderer who's pissed. Um, <laughs> but uh, it gets a mixed reception. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I could talk to you for hours. Like literally, um, but I know you're busy and, um, I have to go to the gym, uh, annoyingly. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to go to the pub. You go to the gym. <laughs> Fantastic. Cheers. Lovely. Cheers. Thanks, man. Cheers for coming on. Top I've man. loved it. Enjoyed it. <laughs>